Hello and welcome to lesson number 18 in the Python tutorial series. Uh, my name is Steve and today we'll be introducing the idea of multi-line variables. Uh, variables are nothing new compared to what we've been doing. Uh, in fact, you've probably used them in just about every program you've written. But thus far they've all been single line variables, that is x equals 4, a single number, or it equals a string, a single line of text. But there are times where we want our variables to span multiple lines. For example, if we wanted a, a single variable that had a five or six line letter that we wanted to write, or a list of information, maybe talking about our favorite brands of cars, or favorite animals, or favorite casino games, things like that, sometimes we want to have those listed, and instead of having a print statement that spans multiple multiple lines you know a print first line print second line print third line uh, we can have variables that span multiple lines in a single variable in fact you saw this back when i did my example program for in the realm of the dragon when i printed a dragon graphic so that's what we're going to focus on today it's going to add a little bit of flair to your programs, it's going to give you a little bit more utility, and I plan on using it in our next project, the Rock, Paper, Scissors project that we'll be doing next. And uh, let's go ahead and get started today. So probably about a month ago, when I first introduced comments, I told you there's two ways to do comments. And when I program, I kind of limit my comments to just the way you've seen me program before using the pound sign. So it's, if we had a, an example function here that we were creating, the first thing that I normally do is use the pound sign and list my comment here. And you've seen that in all of the examples that I provided. And if I want a longer comment, I simply go to the next line and put my second comment and that's the way that I prefer to do it. But of course there is another way to do commenting in your program and that's with multi-line commenting. If I were to create a second example here, uh, instead of using the pound sign I can use triple quotes which are three apostrophes in a row. One, two, three. When I use my three apostrophes everything that comes after it will be in this by default green color. So they, this is my comment. It's going to span multiple lines, but it doesn't matter because I'm triple quoted. So you can see as I'm typing this, uh, every subsequent line is also in green. This is all considered one comment. And in fact, if I started programming here and said I want to return zero, that's in green, that's still considered part of the comment. The comment doesn't end until Python encounters another triple quote. So when I triple quote the end of that, my return statement now turns to the color that you're probably familiar with. So triple quotes uh, allow you to have multi-line comments, but they're also used when we create multi-line variables. So I'm going to go ahead and clear my screen here. Uh, I don't necessarily need those examples anymore. If you want to comment using triple quotes, you're certainly welcome to. But up until this point, when you've created a variable, so we'll call this a single line string as our variable, you've simply set it equal to either uh, quotation marks or apostrophes. This is my string. And that's how you set string variables. If I wanted to create a variable that spanned multiple lines, say for example a, an entire letter, I can do that using a multi-line variable. So I'm going to create a variable called multi-line, and instead of using the normal delimiters, either the apostrophe or the quotation marks, I'm going to use the triple quotes. Now you don't necessarily have to do this, but when I use a multi-line string, I like to start on the following line. So I go ahead and press enter and I'm going to write a letter, dear friend, and I'm going to put my comma there. I was just writing to let you know that I was thinking of you. Have a great day. And that's the end of my letter, so we're going to sign it. Sincerely, Steve. And that's the end of my multi-line variable, so I'm going to triple quote it. And now multi-line as a variable contains all of that information. 
when I run this code over in the Python shell and print multi-line, you can see it go it retains all of the original formatting from the way that I programmed it. Now one side note is if I simply call the variable without a print statement, what it's really doing is it's storing all of the escape sequences. So you can see the, the backslash n's here, backslash n. So when I simply call the variable, it's got all the escape sequences built into it. So the variable itself, while it appears multi-line to you or I when we print it out, Python still is considering that a single line variable. What it's doing is putting in the escape characters for us. So when you're calling your multi-line variables, it's really important to remember to put them into a print statement so that it retains the formatting of when you put it into the programming window. You know, similarly, I might want to have a list of information, so I'm going to call a new variable called casino games. And I'm going to set it equal to a multi-line variable. And this is going to be a list that I want to print later, so it says, well, I'm at a casino. I like to play the following games. I put a colon, I'm going to say one. I like blackjack. Two. I like roulette. And three, I like craps. And I could list my games, and then I'm not good at anything else. End it with my triple quotes, and now I have a variable casino games that has a list of information. This is different than a Python list that we'll get to later. This is simply a list in a string. Now, when I type casino games by itself, all the escape sequences have been added for me, and when I print casino games, it's going to retain the original formatting. Now, one of the reasons that I like the multi-line strings is we're not quite ready to go to graphics yet. Um, adding a neat graphical user interface with mouse buttons and real-time action, uh, it's, it's not really where we're at. But sometimes I want my programs to have some graphics or more user interaction, and this is where I find multi-line variables can be pretty useful. Let's go ahead and clear our program. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a series of variables using ASCII art. ASCII art is something I discussed back in the in the realm of the dragon uh, project number two, and it's simply using regular keyboard characters to create you know a sort of visual representation or or art. So I'm going to create a variable called image zero, and I'm going to try and create some ASCII art here for a big number zero. We'll add three, zero, three there, one, two, let's see there. Yeah, that's looking real good. So what I've done is I've created a bigger representation of the number zero. Let's create an image one variable and try and do the same thing. So let's see, how would we create a one? So there's probably a top part to it. Yeah, that's looking okay. And then maybe put a base on it. Not the best one I've ever drawn, but you get the idea. And let's go ahead and try and make a two, and then we'll cut it there. So we have the top part of the two. We have a front part. It goes down a little bit, and then it curves back. There we go. So there's a big two. So all I'm really doing is drawing some ASCII art here in my image variables. And what I can do is say, um, ask the user to input a number. So x equals input, enter a number 0 through 2. And then of course I want to turn that into an integer, just like we didn't guess the number. And I'm going to say if x equals 0, I'm going to print image 0. Elif x equals 1, I'm going to print 
image 1, and elif x equals 2, I'm going to print image 2. Otherwise, I'm going to print a message invalid selection, because that means I didn't pick 0, 1, or 2. When I run this program and execute it now, oh, wait, uh, Oh, syntax error. I was uh, forgot two equal signs there for a conditional check. I was trying to set x equal to zero. So remember, two two equal signs when you're doing a conditional check. So we're going to enter a number zero through two, and if I enter zero, it's going to print a large zero. If I print one, it's going to print my large one. If I select two, it's going to print my large two. And if I select anything else, it's going to give me an invalid selection. Now where this is going to come into your games, uh, the example that I can think of is the next lesson that we're going to do is writing paper, rock, scissors. And when the user selects paper, I might want to find some ASCII art of a hand making the paper shape, or making the rock shape, or making the scissors shape. So I can create some rudimentary graphics to go along with user selections and have them printed out. So the ASCII art that I drew is rather unimpressive. If you do an internet search for ASCII art, you'll usually find stuff that's a lot better than what I can come up with. Maybe you're an artist and you can draw some of this cool stuff on your own. Me, I usually need the help of the internet. So if I uh, head on over here to Google and I do a search for ASCII art, uh, one of the sites that I really like um, and I found when I started doing the series is this Chris.com website. And when you select this website right here, he's got a, a list of different categories on the left and there's a lot of good usable stuff that you can do in your programs. So let's say I want to do uh, creatures and a unicorn sounds good. I've got a list of all these different images that I can use. I say to myself, gosh, this unicorn looks pretty fabulous. This is what I want in my program. So I'm just going to copy and paste this unicorn off of the website. And then I'm going to head over to my uh, programming window. And I'm going to replace my crudely drawn zero with this unicorn. I've already got the shell of my program here that if the user selects zero, this is the image associated with the selection of zero. And so when I execute this program and enter a number, I hit zero, and now instead of my crudely drawn zero, I'm, I'm getting the picture of a unicorn. So this might be something that you add to your, your games, where if you pick up a sword, you've got an image of a sword. If you pick up an ax, you've got an image of an ax. Uh, it, it just adds some personalization to your smaller text adventures. If I head back over to the uh, website and say, gosh, uh, I want selection one to be a, a birthday message. So I'm going to highlight this birthday cake because that looks pretty good. It looks like what I want. I'm going to replace my crudely drawn one with the birthday cake image. And sure enough, uh, it's all in green, so it looks like it's working correctly. Run my program. Enter zero, I've still got the unicorn accessible, but now when the user selects one, they're getting their happy birthday message. Of course, you've really got to test your programs out. Uh, sometimes ASCII art can create some like bugs or some errors in the way that images are displayed. For example, if we head back over here um, and let's select sports, and the sport we're going for is bowling. And I say to myself, God, this image right here, this is the image that I want. So I'm going to copy and paste it. And just like I did for the other ones, I'm going to add this to my program. Everything looks fine here. Image 2 is a multi-line variable. It's this bowling alley picture. It looks pretty good. But when I execute this program and I select number 2, it doesn't quite display correctly. You can see right here in the middle, the image gets a little wonky. There's something wrong with it. And you need to remember that Python, even though ASCII art is, I mean, ASCII art is definitely cool, but it uses a lot of characters that Python inherently uses for other things. In this case, this uh, backslash right here is also the escape sequence. And so 
I mean, if you think about it over here in the shell, when I print a backslash, the backslash is the escape sequence that tells me to ignore the next character. And I get this syntax error, end of line while scanning string literal. That's because when Python encounters a backslash, it's looking for something after it. If I wanted to print a backslash, I have to add two backslashes to get a single backslash to print. This particular piece of ASCII art has a problem because this backslash, when it goes to the next line, Python is interpreting that as a new line character and pressing enter at the wrong time. If I want to fix that, if I just want a single backslash printed, remember that I need two backslashes. So you get some weirdness if the line ends with a backslash because Python is expecting an escape sequence at that point and it's not getting it. But you can see by adding the second backslash, I've made the art display correctly. Some of the other problems that you might run into is if the artist uses apostrophes in their art, anytime that they use three apostrophes, it's going to end your multi-line string. If in this happy birthday example right here, after the Y, the artist had used three apostrophes for whatever reason, the string gets a little bit goofed up, the middle turns black, and that's because Python is going to interpret this sequence right here as the end of the string. So you might need to adjust how you use your images a little bit if you get some errors like that. The best thing you can do is copy and paste them and then print them right away to see if there's any problems that you might need to address. So it's not a perfect solution, but it is a neat way to get some interesting graphics into your, into your programs. And so that ASCII art really just becomes a part of the Lesson 18 Challenge program that I don't think will throw uh, too many of you for uh, a loop. I think it should be fairly straightforward. You're definitely going to have to be able to pull ASCII images off the internet and create some graphics for your programs. But other than that, it's just uh, use of if, elif, and else loops, as well as a continual program loop that allows the user to quit whenever they want. So you can see over on the left, I've got a menu that allows my user to choose one of five options. Display a sword, an axe, a shield, a random ob object, either a sword, axe, or a shield, or quit the program entirely. So if the user selects one, a picture of a sword appears, two, a picture of an axe appears, and three, a picture of a shield appears. Now when I select a random object, uh, really all it's doing is selecting a random number between one and three and then using that to determine which object shows. So if I select R, I can see the first was a shield, then it selected a sword, then an axe, then a sword, then an axe, then a sword. So every time I select R, I'm getting a different object from my list of objects. And then finally, if the user wants to quit, they can select Q to quit. Um, I've also got it built in so that they can't select something that's not on the list. So let's say they chose number four. It's going to come back with a message, invalid selection, and ask them to choose again. If they choose P, invalid selection. So they can only choose options that are actually on the menu. Of course, if they hit Q, the program exits and it's done running. So that is your challenge program. Have a program that creates a menu that can display one of three pictures along with an option to have a random picture displayed and finally allowing the user to quit if they don't want to run through the program anymore. As always, if you have any questions about the Lesson 18 Challenge program, you're welcome to leave them in the comments and I will help you out any way that I can. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.